All right. Hi, AP humans. Miss Jeffords coming at you with part one of unit six notes, cities and urban land use and patterns and processes. All right. Um, so 6.1, the origin and influences of urbanization. Um, our standard is asking us to explain the processes that initiate and drive urbanization and suburbanization. Um, so things that you need to understand are site and situation, transportation, population and migration, economic government or development, government policies. Um, you guys are going to start to see unit six and unit seven. We're going to really start looping back to all these previous units. It's all coming together. So um, if you're feeling like you're having deja vu you might be because we're doing it we're, we're starting to tie it together okay so you understand you need to understand the term site and situation site factors include the climate availability of water soil quality um, is it like fertile soil and other natural resources and then the situation is like the connections to another place so is it on a river port for trading opportunities um, what type of um, like uh, like other connecting factors are there, uh, like major transportation routes, anything like that. Okay. Site is usually like the physical geography of like what's, what's, what's occurring naturally. And then the situation is more like where, how is it connected in relation to other places? Okay. So, um, site can influence how and where a city develops. So obviously, um, like the Nile civilization, we think about like ancient Egypt, um, it developed along the river, the Nile river and the site situation factors included fresh water, food availability. The surrounding soil was really, really good for farming. The climate was temperate, little warm, little cold, and the desert was a natural defense, right? So that's a good uh, barrier between places around it. Okay, situation again, situation factors connect one site to another site. Um, trade routes, is it on a river or a port? Is it along like a transportation line, like a railroad or even like now along like a major interstate corridor in the United States? All right, the location of Constantinople, which is the capital of Istanbul today, um, it is the gateway between Eurasia, Europe and Asia, and it's also right centered between the Mediterranean and Black Sea. So the situational factors make this an incredibly important um, center along like the Silk Road historically, and still today it is literally the crossroads of Europe and Asia. All right, situation can develop um, or influence how and where a city develops. Many cities developed along transportation and trade, but changes in the way we transport can change a city. So again, used to be like major waterways and then as technology um, advanced railroads and then air travel. Um, so like Denver, for example, when Denver International Airport was built, it kind of changed the game for Denver. It made it an international hub where you can connect, you can get a, a direct flight, you know, from Denver to Mexico or Europe um, or Asia. Whereas before that international airport, you had to go to a coast before you could like get out of the country. Okay, um, today, the Port of New York and Port of New Jersey is one of the largest and busiest ports on the East Coast. Again situation it's located uh right on access to the you know atlantic ocean which obviously is the opening port to europe africa and pretty much the whole trading world all right changes in these processes will initiate and drive urbanization and suburbanization so urban remember is the middle cities and then the suburbs is the housing ring around the cities like the people people live in the suburbs commute into the city um, all of these changes are going to be reflected in transportation, communication, population growth, migration, economic development, and government policies. All right, so transportation, for example, um, how will a city grow or decline if access to these things change? So like back in the day when there were streetcars, it was important for people to live near the city center because the streetcars really only stayed around that center. Cars, so like 1940s when the automobile became like more available to the American public, um, people could move, they could afford to move to the suburbs because you could drive your car in. Um, highways in the 1950s, uh, President Eisenhower realized we needed to have like an interstate transit system for um, our military. They needed to have like an uninterrupted path to get goods and products across the country. And then obviously people are allowed to drive on those as well. Okay. Um, think about the changes in communication back when there was only landlines. Um, I mean, that's kind of, you, you just had landlines, but then all of a sudden we get cell phones and internet access that is going to open up from 
oh, I can only call people, you know, like maybe in my area because I don't want to pay for long distance to when a cell phone was like, well, I can call anyone in pretty much the entire world. And now, I mean, we've just expanded to 5G. Who knows what's next? 6G, um, it just is going to open up our world for transportation and communication. All right. Population growth, migration, and influ um, and how um, urbanization is influenced. Migration encourages cities to grow larger. Uh, we talked about this in unit two, population and migration, um, that the majority of the world lives in cities now. Um, when people migrate, they are often coming to cities because they're looking for economic opportunities, education opportunities, um, health care access, or access to the culture and arts that come with living in a bigger city. All right. Uh, sorry, I'm moving myself all over the place here. Um, so obviously economic development. So unit seven is all about development in the world, like basically why are countries rich and poor? And so um, this is really evident here. So Rio de Janeiro, a major city in Brazil, um, this is, you can see here, like you have the developed urban core where like your, your bigger buildings, high density housing, but pretty nice. But then look at what's going on here. So you can see there's like a little narrow greenway or beltway um, and then all of a sudden you get into this area called a favela and a favela is going to be kind of like the lower income, kind of the ghetto. Um, and, um, but obviously you can see it's still really connected to that urban core, but there's clearly a division of haves and haves not have nots here. All right. Um, ooh, ooh, do not make me bigger. Okay. A city's economic function will also have an important impact on urbanization. So manufacturing, tourism services, governmental and political. Um, so like, uh, we have a place in the United States called the Rust Belt. We've talked a little bit about that. It's an area around like the Great Lakes in the Northeast that was heavy industry, um, in the, you know, during the industrial revolution and into like the 1970s, 1980s. That's where cars were being made. That's where steel was being processed. Um, people worked in factories. Well, as as our as our um, economic system in the United States has changed, a lot of those factories have shuttered. They've become dilapidated, and we call that area the Rust Belt because those pla those old factories are like just vacant. Um, they're rusting out, and so obviously that has changed. Um, people, you know, the poverty levels are high. The crime rates the crime rates have raised. Um, it, it's you know, uh, um, if a, if a city no, is known for tourism, that obviously ups the value of that place, right? Because people come from all over. Um, Colorado Springs has become, I see it ranked on all these lists as like the number two most desirable place in the world. Um, you know, one of the top tourist destinations, not only in the United States, but globally. Um, and therefore it's reflected in like the cost of housing. Talk to your guys' parents about how much it costs to live in Colorado Springs right now. It's It's pretty crazy. Okay. Um, mm, look at this. Uh, all right. Oh, so here we go. There's a little video for you to watch. Colorado Springs, the best city to live in the world. Watch it. And I'd be curious to hear your guys' opinions on that. Uh, but government policies also impact this. Like what is going to make people want to come here? Um, do we have good infrastructure? So do we have like good public transportation? Do we have good roads? Do we have good school system? Um, is it safe? Do we have places for entertainment? You know, in, you know Colorado Springs is attractive for people that are attracted to the outdoors. So obviously there's that. Um, businesses, what is the incentive for a business to situate here? So Colorado Springs has become increasingly important for uh, like industrialization and development in Colorado. We are pretty much center in the United, in the state of Colorado, right? So like if you have the state of Colorado, nice little rectangle, we're pretty much mac, smack dab in the center. Um, yes, Denver has the, you know, I-70 corridor that goes east and west. Um, Denver is certainly the bigger, but Colorado Springs is actually more geographically centered, easy access to Denver and Northern Colorado, but we also have easy access to like Pueblo, Southern Colorado. So um, hence, you know, we're starting to see a lot of these, um, like major industries come here. Um, also, you know, in and outs and Whataburgers. Guys, I haven't even seen you, I think, since the announcement was made that Whataburger was coming to Colorado Springs. <laughs> uh, move over in and out, in my humble opinion. But um, yeah, so Colorado Springs has become like, it's geographically located. Um, businesses can still get in here more affordably than they could in Denver. We have a lot more land available than Denver. Um, if you guys have driven up Powers Boulevard anytime in the last year, you've seen the huge Amazon building. So there was um, t some tax incentives for Amazon to come to El Paso County where you live. Um, so again, 
our city is going to grow because government policies are going to attract it to come here. And again, you guys can see down here a lot of uh, little examples of this. Oop. Okay, locational advantages of early cities. There's a little question for you. Um, I would encourage you guys to pause on this and try to come up with an answer. And then there's your answer. Okay. The presence and growth of cities vary across geographic locations because of physical geography and resources. This comes back to like unit one, environmental determinism versus possibilism. Remember those concepts? So changes in any or all of these things influence urbanization. So transportation, communication, population growth, migration, economic development, and government policies can either make your city grow or it could cause it to decline. Okay, awesome. 6.2, cities across the world. Um, in this standard, we are going to explain the processes that initiate and drive urbanization and suburbanization. Mega cities and meta cities are distinct spatial outcomes of urbanization, increasingly located in countries of the periphery and semi-periphery. Uh, you're gonna see this in unit seven. We haven't super got there yet, but um, understand we have, there's like three different stages your country can be in. It's either a core country, which is like, things are happening there. Semi-periphery are the ones literally like touching the border of a core country that really are benefiting from being next to a core. And then the periphery are like the, the like outskirts, like they're kind of like the last to get the things, if you will. Okay. So processes of suburbanization, urban sprawl, and decentralization have created new land use forms, including edge cities, exurbs, boom burbs, and new challenges. Um, again, I said this several times, our world is increasingly urban. More people live in an urban area than anywhere before or any other time in history. And that's exciting, but that also comes with some downsides, right? Um, you, you can get to a point where it's too big to provide for the people and it creates a whole different set of challenges. Okay, so what will we learn? Um, seeing a trend across the world over time, people are moving from rural to urban areas exponentially. So again, we're growing faster than ever before in cities. But once they get there, what's the deal? All right, so key concepts here. So you guys need to know what a mega city is. Mega city. Cities with 10 million or more residents. <laughs> That's so crazy. And a meta city is a sprawling urban area with more than 20 million residents. So this could be where there are several cities like connected and there's literally like no open space between them. Okay, so think about this. Transportation, housing production, landscape preferences, and social and demographic trends. Um, all of these things, again, are going to be influenced positively or negatively being in a mega or meta city. I mean, again, a city with 10 or 20 million people obviously is going to have big issues. So this is crazy, guys. Look at this. 33 mega cities on Earth right now. Um, so again, this is an interesting map. I love this. Um, so we're looking at like the dot is a current mega city. And then they're predicting the dot with a circle is going to be a future mega city. So obviously they're looking at like growth patterns and, you know, trends happening there. Um, so again, we have 33 currently, and then by the year 2030, so nine years from now, they're predicting six more mega cities are going to be official. So that's kind of wild, okay? And again, it, like in the United States, it shouldn't surprise you, New York City and LA, those are our two mega cities on East Coast. You know, we have West Coast and East Coast, um, and then Chicago is the emerging mega city. Okay, so growth of mega cities. So look at this, 1950. Oh my gosh, sorry, I'm trying to get myself off the map. There we go. 1950. Um, you guys can see here, uh, this is where the mega cities were. Most countries are located in the northern hemisphere. Guys, look at the pattern here. Um, the vast majority, we know the vast majority of population, if you remember unit two, is above the equator, north of the equator. Um, but there's also some interesting correlations with development here. And again, unit seven, we will we'll revisit all that. Okay. All right. Year 2000. So 50 years after that first map, um, look at the shift that's starting to happen, okay? All of a sudden, it seems like the the presence of these megacities is moving south. And I mean, there's no question. Those are north. These are starting to get more central and south. 2015, look at this. How does, the, how does this affect the people that live there and the infrastructure? So if a city grows super, super fast, can the roads and schools and hospitals and sewage systems keep up with that growth? Um, what are the challenges that come with that? 
All right. Ooh. Regional pressure. Um, share of people living in urban areas in 2017. So again, uh, the darkest blues are going to be the majority of those people are living in an urban area. And then we certainly still have pockets of sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East here, and Southeast Asia that are still maybe even more rural, like living in villages, but certainly emerging as cities. But the vast majority of the world is living in an urban area. All right, global patterns of urbanization. So check this out. Um, so there's two sets of data going on on this map. The color of the country is the percentage urban. And then there is the dot of showing actually like cities and like what's going on with their populations. So you guys can see here, for example, um, I believe uh, this map is kind of hard to see at scale. I think, uh, I don't know what is this actually. I was going to say, is that Denver? but it doesn't look like it because what would be north of Denver? I don't know. Someone needs to look at that map for me and get a little more detail for me. But again, you can see a direct correlation between the amount of people that are living in urban areas and then how big the cities are that they're of where they're living. Um, you guys can see some interesting spatial patterns here. Large cities develop along coasts. That makes sense historically um, because that's where access to trade and transportation was. All right, urbanization and poverty. Um, so, I mean, this is, again, kind of straight straightforward here. Um, what's interesting here, percentage of population living in poverty. So, uh, the level of urbanization is down here. So, down here is like 10, only 10% urbanized all the way up to like 100% urbanized. And you can see from the way that this graph is, can we make the hypothesis that the less urbanized it is, the more poverty there is, which is interesting because sometimes we hear about cities being full of, oh, there's a lot of homeless people, a lot of, you know, poverty. But in reality, people go to cities because there's opportunities for jobs. We've talked about that or education to get a higher income. Um, people who stay, remain in rural areas tend to be more subject to this like big poverty. Okay. Um, so here are some examples of, um, like a periphery. So remember I talked about periphery are the ones that are like kind of on the outside, outside. So Lagos, Nigeria, um, this is a really, it's a really interesting because it's a developed city. It's one of the most developed cities in Africa, but check out what happens when you get to like the out, the outskirts, if you will, like the ghetto area. Um, and you can see this is, this is pretty abject poverty here. Oops. Okay. Nairobi, Kenya. Again, look what happens here. Very developed core, central business district. Nice. And then the outskirts. Okay. And this is the same cities. Okay. Rio de Janeiro. Check this out. Again, you have a pretty sprawling, huge, um, nice developed area. And then again, we saw this picture earlier, right not too far from the beautiful downtown, you've got squatter settlement. Okay. Mumbai, India, very developed central business district. And then you're living again in squatter settlements. All right, so think about these questions. Identify the relationship between population and the growth of megacities in less developed countries. Explain why urban areas in nations on the periphery are growing at rapid rates. And describe how urbanization can impact a country's transition to stage three or four of the demographic transition model. Ah, oh, we love that. We love spiraling back to that unit. Okay, so again, here's your takeaway. Explain the significance of geographic similarities and differences among locations and or at different times. How has transportation, housing production, landscape preferences, and social and demographic trends um, affected basically where people are living? Okay, key vocab from this, and I believe the, la the second part of your 6.2 continued notes, this is what you need to know. What's a megacity? What's a metacity? we talked about those urban sprawl that's just basically when the cities are just growing wide 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 and taking over areas of land outside of it suburbanization that is going to be the movement of upper and middle class people from the urban core to the outskirts um, fountain is considered a suburb right we're a suburb of colorado springs um if you live in fountain you probably don't work in fountain very few we don't have enough like businesses here so instead of working here you live here and you commute right you commute to colorado springs you commute to Pueblo, you commute to Fort Carson, or, I mean, obviously with COVID, you know, people can work remotely. Exurbs, prosperous residential districts beyond the suburbs. So probably the best example for our area is going to be the Broadmoor. Um, that's very, very wealthy, and it's, it's beyond the reach of the suburbs. Edge city, 
Uh, this is an economic center on the fringe of a city with an extensive amount of office and retail space, typically near a major road. Um, the best example is in Denver, the Denver Tech Center. So if you're familiar with like where the IKEA is off of I-25, not too far like north and then across I-25 is the Denver Tech Center. And that has developed as an edge city. Um, it basically was too expensive and it was too limited to, uh, to get office space in downtown Denver. Like like there was just no more room or it was just really expensive. So they just said, well, why don't we just build our own huge, tall offices? So if you drive to Denver next time, pay attention, you'll see signs for the DTC, Denver Tech Center. And that's that's a great example of an edge city. All right. Um, so here's some models, again, of edge cities here. Um, so what you guys can see here is the central business district. That's going to be like your downtown. Um, and you're going to see basically how this develops. So like Back in the day, you might have it in the middle, and then you you have your your core or your rings. Hmm, this looks a lot like like bid rent theory or von Tunen model, doesn't it? Oh, okay. And then as it develops, you might get like an inner ring. So there might be like a like a new housing development that kind of squishes in between some existing stuff. And then you guys can see here. Here's what's happening when you get like a like a modern city like in in now denver very much is like this so you have like a central business district but then you have like a high-tech area then you have a place where they have all the like big hospitals then there's going to be like the area where the research um, facilities for like a university are airports are obviously located usually outside of city limits um stapleton airport was the airport in denver up until about 2000 uh maybe even a little before that and um it literally got too dangerous to fly airplanes in and out of there because it just got surrounded by houses. That's why DIA is so far out of Denver because they tried to build it as far away from like housing and development as possible. But it's crazy. Every time I go to DIA now, I swear there's more houses getting closer and closer and closer, which was like the reason they built it away. But then they've just filled all that land up anyway. Eh. Urban sprawl, y'all. Um, gentrified neighborhood. Ooh, we're going to talk about gentrification in a little while. Um, so again, just ideas of what an edge city um, would look like among a current central business district. Okay, urban sprawl. Here we go. This is suburbia, right? So we just build out, not up, um, because there's we have plenty of room to build out, and people don't want to live in an apartment in the suburbs. They want to live in their own house with their own yard, and we've talked a lot about this. Okay, transportation, check this out. Um, if As long as you have access via highway, train, rail, boat, ferry, whatever it needs to be, um, it doesn't bother Americans to live a little bit out of the city because they can commute in. Um, and obviously you get these like crazy, um, like mouse traps. Um, I've seen them called like spaghetti bowls. Where it's just like all the roads cross and it's all like crisscrossed and crazy. All right, look at this growth of the suburbs. Um, Y'all, this is kind of crazy here. Um, so what's going on here is it's showing over here how much has the city grown, the city, the actual like city limits, and then how much has their suburb grown. So for example, like you can see if the further out you've grown, Austin, the city itself might not have grown so much, but the suburbs, like the little new towns around it have. Um, I'm honestly surprised Denver's not on this map because it seems like in my lifetime, like several new places in Denver have been created. Um, Greenwood Village, uh, uh, oh my God, now I'm, Highlands Ranch, I believe, became like unincorporated. Stapleton, where the old airport was, they cut the airport out and then they build houses and schools and parks and all that good stuff. Lone Tree, Centennial, those are all like new towns that have been invented in Denver in my lifetime. And I've lived in Colorado my whole life, practically. So, um, yeah, I'm like I said, I'm really su surprised. Honestly, Denver's not on this map. Okay, boom burbs. Look at this, a boom burb. Um, that is just when, obviously, like it just has exploded. It's booming, right? And so it is not only becoming a suburb where people just live; they're actually starting to build a whole new commercial area around it. Um, you know, north end of Colorado Springs with our In and Out, the new Whataburger, Shields, Bass Pro Shop, the shops at Briar Gate. All of Great Wolf Lodge, that is mega employment opportunities as well. So not only is it a place where people are living, but it's like it's just become filled with commercial stuff. All right. So again, just another example of a Boomberg. Okay. Um, Atlanta, Georgia, major, major city in the South. Um, I mean, it, it's it's hugely important for many reasons. Um, but you guys can see here all these like little towns around it are basically their own 
edge cities. Um, they're connected to Atlanta through transportation, through culture, through commerce, but they're also all kind of independently operating now. I think that's the key to understand, guys. An edge city really can kind of support itself independently. A suburb is still so heavily residential that it really needs like an urban core to, to support it. Fountain is still definitely a suburb. We don't have enough commerce here to like independently float. We still all have to go to Colorado Springs usually to get things, right? We have to go there to get a prom dress or we have to go there to get um, sporting equipment from like uh, the Dick Sporting Goods or something like that. And Edge City might have its own version of all that stuff and you wouldn't have to go too far to get those things. Okay. And again, you guys can see here, getting into just a little bit, you can see how Atlanta is kind of spread out like that. Okay. So again, just several examples here. And then again, exurbs are the ones that you can live like really far out from people and, and either work remotely or you can afford to transport yourself into your central job every day. Okay, here's a question you guys might want to pause on and then look at the answer and think about why that would be the case. And then here's your vocabulary review for your notes. Nice little matching activity there. Okay. Here we go. 6.3, cities and globalization. Explain how cities embody the process of globalization. World cities function at the top of the world's urban hierarchy and drive globalization. Cities are connected globally by networks and linkages and mediate global processes. Um, so couple this one, again, a lot of vocab words for you to know here. So what's a world city? It's also called a global city. If you see those words, they're inter interchangeable. Um, it's a has influence not within its region, but around the world. Um, examples are New York, London, Paris, Tokyo. Um, if you guys have ever seen those shirts or like tote bags and it'll say like New York, London, Paris, Tokyo. And it's like, that's where you think of like art, fashion, political power, world finance. I mean, those are major cities. I do love the shirts. I've seen them before where it's like New York, London, Paris, Tokyo, Colorado Springs. And it's like, it's, it's a joke, right? Um, again, they're the centers of the financial world, stock exchanges, banking industry, uh, multinational -com company headquarters. I mean, they're just, they're just, they're world cities. I mean, there's just, what else is there to say? Okay. They're connected and they drive globalization. Globalization operates on a large scale and leaves very few people unaffected, even in hard to reach areas. So you could be living in a pretty isolated part of the Amazon or Sub-Saharan Africa, and to some degree, you're probably still affected by what goes on in a global city. Multinational, multinational corporations cluster in these world cities. They create vast networks to facilitate their services. Um, manufacturing and trading networks, transportation, banking, and communication are all obviously like driven through world city locations. Okay, love Times Square, New York City. If you guys have never been, go. It's so cool. It's way overwhelming, but it's really cool. Um, world cities spread their culture to other areas. So what types of networks can you see in this image? Um, how many multinational corporations do you notice in the image of Times Square? And then what other, what other cities have some sort of the same fashion, entertainment, and financial industries? So again, just look here and just, uh, you know, I mean, it is what it is. Here's a nice little blown up, blown up. Think about the cost of advertising in Times Square. I mean, it's just pretty astronomical. And then the cost of real estate, right, to own an office. Um, I've eaten at a uh, Applebee's. Oh, there's the McDonald's I've eaten at in Times Square. Uh, yeah. And, you know, real New Yorkers, they're not all about Times Square. It's a way too touristy for them. But please promise me when you go to New York City, um, even if you're, like, cool and, like, not touristy, still go to Times Square and get the obligatory I Heart New York shirt and take the selfies there because it's really cool. Okay, look at um, Shibuya Crossing, Tokyo, Japan. This is one of the busiest crosswalks in the world. Um, I think in class we've actually watched the, the webcams of this before. If not, you should look it up. Um, but again, you guys can see kind of the same idea here. Okay, what similarities and connections do you notice between Times Square and Tokyo, Japan? And again, both global cities. All right, world functions or world cities function at the top of that urban hierarchy. Um, New York City is home to the New York Stock Exchange. It's also the headquarters of the United Nations. So obviously, two very important things. Um, not to bum everyone out, but you know, think about the September 11th terrorist attacks. Um, the motivation to take out 
the symbols of the World Trade World Trade Center in New York City. Um, that was, you know, what was the message behind that attack um, on our city, on New York City. Um, these global cities are linked by global processes. So media hubs, financial markets, and services. Um, there's huge labor force just because of the population of these cities. They're centers for creativity, innovation, technological infrastructure. Um, these cities can collaborate to solve problems. Often, like um, when you hear about like international like pollution or like green movements, um, or you know the United Nations, the whole job is of those cities, those countries in the UN to get together and like talk about their issues before people just start going to war. Um, so think about like what connects all these major cities. Okay, a little practice question for you. You can pause here and try to answer. Another one for you there. And a third one. Okay, we're almost done with part two, guys, or part one, sorry. Okay, 6.4, size and distribution of cities. Identify the different urban concepts such as hierarchy, interdependence, relative size, and spacing that are useful for explaining the distribution, size, and interaction of cities. Um, principles that are useful for explaining the distribution and size of cities include rank size rule, primate city, gravity, and crystal or central place theory. Uh, this unit is very model heavy. Um, so again, this idea that in like a perfect flat world with like no interruptions, this is what it would look like. And then obviously realize real world conditions are going to affect it, but you can get the idea of the patterns that exist when you see these different models in place. Okay. Uh, words you need to know, primate city, that's, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about these, rank size rule and gravity model. So you can pause and fill in your vocab on your charts here. Okay. Um, and then the distribution of the, and the interactions of the cities always have social, political, and economic um, impact. All right. So here's an example of uh, what's called the primate city rule or rank. Uh, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry. Where am I going here? God, primate city. Okay, so what this is, is that there's, the theory here is that there's countries that have a mega city, like we're talking, and maybe not technically a mega city, but like a giant city. And then every other city is just nowhere close to being in that size. So you can see this in Dhaka, Bangladesh. So the city of Dhaka is almost 9 million people. And then the next biggest city is only two and a half million. And then 763,000 and it just drops. So primate city is like, Bah, and then nothing in the area comes close to it. Okay. South Korea, same thing. Seoul, South Korea, 25 million people. Yeah. 25 million people, guys. And then the next biggest city is only 8 million people. And then the next biggest city is only close to 3 million people. And you can see it just drops down from there. Okay. Rank size rule. So this one's a little bit more interesting. So the way that rank size rule works is that it is the biggest city. So city number one, whatever your, your, your primate city is, right? And then city number two is two nths of city number one. So it roughly comes out to being half the size of the city above it. The third biggest city is a third of the size of city number one and so on and so forth. And you guys can see that here in Canada. It's really interesting. So Toronto, 6 million people. And then Montreal, Quebec has 4 million people. So I know it's not perfect math that this isn't necessarily two ends of that. It's not like half the size, but it's, it's close. And then, but look at this. Then we go from four to two and a half. And then from two and a half, we go to one and a half. And I mean, again, you can see how it just like, just like takes a half and it just like trickles down that way. Okay. Again, here in Germany, you guys can see Berlin, 3.2 million. And then all of a sudden it drops to 1.7 million and it, it just goes down by like the next level. So two nths, three nths, so on and so forth. Okay. Gravity model. Um, oops, sorry. So the gravity model is all about the idea that two cities of similar population size are going to be attracted to each other. They're going to interact. So um, you have like, for example, I know Colorado Springs and Denver aren't necessarily the same size city, but they're big cities and we are gravitationally attracted to each other. Um, just this yesterday on Easter, 
uh, we had family coming down from Denver to visit us here in Colorado Springs. And I was asking them about the traffic and they said, oh my gosh, there was so much traffic on I-25 going between Denver and Colorado Springs. So we're still, there's gravity pulling those cities together. Um, Los Angeles and New York City, think about this for a second, two big cities in the United States, technically mega cities, but how many times do you ever watch like the Kardashians or like some YouTuber? It was like, oh yeah, it was, you know, going between my house in New York City and Los Angeles. There's a gravitational pull. They, they're hubs for entertainment. They're hubs for, you know, shopping and fashion and and, and stuff like that. Okay. Um, religious. So obviously religious centers are going to attract people. Um, there's a gravity between a city that has like a religious importance to the cities around it. So here, um, this is in South America. Uh, it's a, you know, oh no, I'm sorry. This is the Vatican. Uh, um, people, obviously it attracts people from all over Europe or Catholics from around the world. Here's the, uh, the mosque in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, attracts Muslims from all over the world to come there. Okay, here's multiple choice you can practice on. Okay, so again, here's a takeaway for your vocab. A primate city, um, again, the biggest city, strengths of this, that it's the social, economic, and political center point, but the weakness is that all the resources are in one place. So unless you have access to that primate city, you might miss out on stuff if you're living in that area. Rank size rule, variety of services and they share power, but the weaknesses could be communication. So if you have a lot of important things going on um, in countries with rank size cities, um, it might be hard to keep them all in the same place. And then the gravity model, the impact of the gravity model is the size, distance, and function. So um, the size of the population, how far apart they are, and then what is actually going on are all going to contribute to how much those cities actually interact with each other. Okay, Chris Dollar's central place theory explains the distribution of goods and services across a region. Um, so notice that he uses hexagons. You read this in AMSCO, um, and it was also one of your vocab words. Hexagons were used because they easily nest together and it doesn't create like overlapping spaces and stuff like that. Each hexagon is going to actually, it, it represents a place basically, and the range of the goods and services there. Okay, vocab words you need to know for central place theory. Threshold, size of the population necessary for the service to exist and be profitable. And the range is the distance people will travel for those services or goods. Oops. Sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip these. You guys can definitely go back and pause. <laughs> Sorry, lots of little case studies in here. Okay, so I wanted to get to this. So goods and services with high ranges. Range, how far people are willing to travel to get to something. If people are looking for specialized medical care, they're gonna travel pretty far for it. Like if you know that the world's renowned heart surgeon um, is you know, a thousand miles away, you are probably gonna figure out a way to go travel that thousand miles to get the, that service, okay? Um, a low, a, basic example I can think of here, um, when it's like homecoming and prom season, um, when guys and girls are ready to go shopping for their dress or their suit or whatever it is, um, oftentimes they will actually go to Denver. Um, so they're still willing to drive to Denver, even though it is further away than just going up to Colorado Springs. Um, uh, but they're obviously attracted by better selection, um, more variety of things to pick from there, okay? So a high range, how far are people willing to drive to get to a service? The more specialized the service, then obviously the higher range. Um, I live on the Mesa. There's a come and go half a mile from my house. So if I need gas or hot chocolate, they have like really good hot chocolate. Um, I'm just gonna go to that come and go. I'm not gonna drive to a come and go in Colorado Springs. There literally is just one right here. Um, but I need something, I want some cheap furniture um, I might drive to Ikea, which is obviously going to be in Denver. Okay, threshold. Threshold is something, it, threshold is the amount of people needed to make that good or service profitable. So obviously things that need a lot more people to operate, there's fewer of them available, right? You're not going to have 10 major league baseball stadiums in one state because it's going to spread your people out too much. Um, so threshold like, for example, a baseball stadium, so I think of Coors Field in Denver, they need, what, 60,000 people to attend games to, like, basically 
like fill the stadium to make some profit. Um, so therefore they have a pretty high range. People are willing to drive pretty far to go to a Rockies game. Um, I have friends that live in Wyoming that will drive down to go to Rockies games. I have friends that live in Grand Junction, which is practically Utah. They'll drive over to come to a Rockies game. Um, but again, very different for them than to, to come to a thing with a high threshold um, versus something that doesn't need that many. My friends in Grand Junction are not going to drive to my come and go in Fountain because um, they've got one there, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, again, just other things that need a high threshold. Um, this is Wall Street in New York City. So obviously there's not a lot of Wall Streets available. So this Wall Street's really important. It needs a lot of people to come to it. Airports, you know, DIA, um, it's frustrating because sometimes it's cheaper to fly out of Denver than it is Colorado Springs. Many times it is. Um, that also has to do with supply and demand, right? But, um, you know, here I am. I, I'll drive to Denver to catch a flight somewhere and I drive right by the Springs Airport and I'm just like, oh, it's literally right there. But Denver obviously needs a lot higher threshold to stay operational, uh, but it has a higher range. More people are willing to drive from further different distances to go there. Okay. Low range and low threshold. So I've kind of said, said this. Um, so gas stations, that's why there's a lot of them. They don't need that many people to stay profitable and people aren't, aren't willing to drive that far, especially if you need gas, you're not going to like roll around on empty because you're looking for the cheapest gas. Like it's like urgent. You need to stop just the first one you can find. Okay. So I want you guys to think about like, um, you know, like food. Um, so look down here. So this is like kind of like to me, it looks like your pretty standard offering of food um, that you could get at, you know, any sit down ish type restaurant. This is a higher low range. So how far are people willing to drive for wings and a uh, Reuben maybe? Pizza, onion rings, burgers, french fries, donuts, chicken burgers, french fries. I mean, again, this is pretty standard food that I can get at Fountain. Um, you know, I'm not necessarily going to drive to the Applebee's in Denver. I'm going to drive to the Applebee's on 8587. Okay. Um, okay. Grocery store. Okay. A little bit different, maybe, if you have a specific grocery store you like. Um, I personally really like shopping at Sprouts and like natural grocers, and we don't have one of those in Fountain. Um, so I drive, I'll drive to Colorado Springs to go grocery shopping. Um, this is a mall. That would be nice if malls came back, right? So that's a throwback to the 90s. You guys are bringing back everything else from the 90s. Why don't you bring back malls? Um, and again, bigger threshold. Um, it needs more people to support a mall than it does to support a grocery store. Okay, practice question for you to pause here on. All right, and then central place theory, like I said, that's the idea, uh, it's the hexagons, um, and that's the idea that you have a central business district, you have a market in the center. And then basically how far does that market's influence extend until you find another market that serves another group of places? So it depends on threshold and range of basically how many market centers and how big is the central place that's being served. All right. Okay. Last one for six point, uh, unit six, part one notes. You guys have been super. Okay. 6.5 internal structure of cities, um, models and theories that are useful for explaining internal structures of cities include Burgess concentric zone model, Hoyt sector model, Harrison Ult, uh, and Ullman multiple nuclei, the galactic city, bid rent theory, and urban models drawn from Latin America, Southeast Asia, and Africa. Model overload. Brace yourselves. You're going to be all right. You'll be fine. Okay. There are many various theories and models that help explain how cities form. These models and theories try to make sense of housing, transportation, business, land use patterns that we see. Where and how people live, work, and travel will change over time, and the structure of a city will change as well. Today, our cities don't look the same as they did 100, 50, or even 20 years ago, and we're going to look at these land use patterns. Okay, so again, this is super, super model-heavy section. All right, we've talked about bid rent theory. So remember, location, location, location. What are you willing to pay to be in the right location for your needs? So here is the business. Here's the market, the people that are going to buy my product. Um, how much is the land going to cost versus how far away from that market is it? Remember Von Thunen model, that first ring, that dairy and market gardening. That's why it's so expensive because it's super close to the, the central business district. Um, think about people who live close to downtown or even in downtown. They pay premium versus living a little further out. 
Okay. Again, we just, just talked about that one. All right. Little. So again, you guys can see how this changes over time. And you can you can go back. I'm going to post this whole lecture, the whole slideshows um, on Schoology as well. So you guys can just go back and click at your own pace. Oh, do you see the rings? Da, 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 da. Okay. Oh, again, this looks a lot like Von Tunen model, doesn't it? Oh my gosh. Okay, here we go. Burgess Concentric Zone. Based on the city of Chicago in the 1920s, a dude named Ernest Burgess looks at the relationship between socioeconomic status of households and distance from the CBD. Basically, where people can afford to live in, re in relationship to where they work. Okay, so what you had is the central business district that was the middle of the city. The first ring around it, he called the zone of transition. That's when you start to move out of like high rises and kind of get into more like just like lower elevation places. Then you have a working class zone. So the people who are working in maybe the factories or they're working in like the sewage services, kind of like the, you know, especially back in the day, like the jobs that were for like lower education, lower income, um, they lived relatively close. Think about the connection here. You're low income. You work in the central business district. You need to be able to affordably transport yourself to work. Probably don't have a car. So you're either relying on maybe a street car or some, you know, basic form of public transportation or you're walking. Um, so it, the working class ended up living not too far out from the city ring because they needed to have easy access to work. Then you get into the residential zone. This is going to be like our first um, kind of like nicer ring of houses. And then finally you have a commuter zone, which again is very much dependent on the idea that I can live far enough out from the riffraff of the city, but I have a car or I can afford to use the transportation to get me into my job each day. Okay. Whether the limitations or weaknesses, um, it's outdated. So transportation has changed the game. Um, and because we are in a global economy, just like that basic ring theory is kind of not as, um, reliable now. Um, this was also only applicable to an American city Inner city is low income while the suburbs are wealthier. However, the opposite is the norm elsewhere. So what's really interesting in like Latin America and Europe, you see the wealthiest people live in the inner city and it's the, the poor live on the ring. We saw that earlier um, when we were looking at the favelas in Brazil and Rio de Janeiro. They're on the, the perimeter. Wealthy, wealthy live in the cities. Urban renewal and gentrification. So as we've developed and um, people have started to take more of a concern about the environmental impact of living in the city and then just like open, like making the cities better for everybody, um, what started to happen is like formerly, formerly lower class housing areas have been changed and they've been gutted and they've been renewed. Um, if you watch HTD, HGTV, this is what they do, right? They go into like low income abandoned houses, knock it down or just gut it and they rebuild these really cool, charming houses. But the poor people who traditionally have lived in that neighborhood no longer can afford to live there. They're replacing them with a little higher income group that can afford these new houses. Okay, Hoyt sector model. Um, so you'll see this here in just a second. So this dude named Homer Hoyt, what a name, looked at the concentric zone model and was like, mm, I'm gonna make some changes here. So his main premise was that cities develop in wedge-like sectors, not in rings, like picture like slices of pie. Um, he also says that the central business district is still important. It, it always is gonna be important, but that these the sectors that develop follow transportation routes that radiate from the city center. So um, if the city is on a port of water, then maybe where is like the river that goes into the port or maybe where's a canal or where's the railroad, where's the streetcar line? That's a line and you can picture like a wedge of information like following that track. Different socioeconomic groups move outward from the city center along railroads and highways. Okay, so Hoyt sector model. So we have the central business district. And then check this out. You've got your rail here. So this is like two sets of railroads that are coming out from the central city area. And then look, it, the industry. Keep that stuff far enough away that the noise and the smell and the sound are not going to like impact people that are like chilling in the city center, but they're really easy to get to. But you can see that is like a wedge. It is literally just makes like a wedge coming out. Okay. Then enter highway. 
Okay, cool. We're going to build a major highway. Instead of cutting the highway right through the heart of downtown, we're going to go around. Denver is a perfect example of this. I-25, it goes around the outskirt of downtown Denver. Um, and so you never, you don't drive on I-25 right through the middle of downtown. Um, it cuts around the outside of that. Okay. Oh, look at this. Are these new areas of like, is this a Denver tech center? Is this an edge city? Is this like a little suburb pocket over here? Again, you can see how these things develop along those major rail and transportation lines. And then again, we get another sector. So again, you, you just start to see how this pattern develops over and over. And then look at what we're left with. These are like little slices of pie that radiate from a city center. Hoyt argues, again, this is more realistic than like just perfectly round, round rings that go around the center of a city. Okay. Oh, look at that. Looks pretty good. Okay, what are the limitations? Again, outdated based on early 20th, early 20th century trail transport, rail transport. Um, today, cars allow us to drive and commute from cheaper land outside the city boundaries. So again, I like living in Fountain because my house is much more affordable than it would be if it was in Colorado Springs. Sure, I have to drive, you know, 10 minutes to get to the Springs, but NBD. Today, the traditional CBD has become less important as numerous office and retail buildings have moved to the burbs. So again, um, we are starting to see like these edge cities that are like, well, we can just build our own office buildings out here and we're, we're going to be cheaper transportation, whatever. Okay, here's a little question for you for practice. All right, internal structure of cities. Um, these models are going to try to make sense of housing, transportation, and business land patterns we see. Cost, it all comes back to money, 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 money. It's an important factor and influences the location of industry, businesses, and where different socioeconomic statuses live. None of them are perfect. All the models have limitations. Times change and cities will evolve based on different factors, including transportation and the technology. Okay. Um, where people and how people live, work, and travel will change over time. Um, our cities today, again, don't look the same as they did 20 years ago, let alone 100 years ago. And then here's some of the more land use patterns. So Harrison Ullman multiple nuclei model. Um, by 1945, whoops, transportation had really changed and cities started to evolve. So post-World War II America, um, we see, again, the birth of, like, automobiles for the consumer. Um, therefore, we are starting to see, like, highways and, like, road systems become more and more prevalent. Now, there are multiple central business districts in a city. The original is still there, but others have developed. So, again, Denver, I always go back because it's it's accessible. You have lower, you have downtown Denver, the skyscrapers, the one with the cash register building. It looks like a little cash register. Um, and you have all the skyscrapers. But then you also have that Denver Tech Center. Then you have the place where Ikea is. You have the place... Um, there is Aurora that has its own like little central business district. Obviously, the central Denver still draws. That's where Coors Field is. That's where the Pepsi Center is. That's close to the Invesco Mile High, whatever the name of the stadium that the Broncos play at. It's Mile High. I've been here long enough to call it Mile High. Um, and so obviously, the central business district of Denver is still like the main hub, but there are plenty of people who live in the fringe of it that that have their own services that they never really have to go into the central Denver unless they want to. Okay, so again, you guys can see here how we see that played out. And again, right here. Okay, oh, look at that. See how it grows over time? And again, this will be on Schoology for you guys to click through at your own pace as well. Okay, the galactic city. We love this. Um, it was also called the peripheral models. Um, so imagine that the uh, model is a galaxy, a center with planets around it. So the galactic model is based on the post-industrial city. So remember, post-industrial, it's one of your vocab words. Um, that's basically that they've shut down, they've moved past like industrial-based, and now they're kind of more like maybe it's like a research center for or university or um, high-tech. Um, so they're not necessarily making products anymore, but this could be the place they're inventing the products or they're researching the products. Cars are now the main method of transportation. People have moved out of the city into the suburbs. Highways and beltways have been built to provide access to the original CBD. Edge cities have popped up. So the way that we see this on here, 
let's look at how the planets around the city now. So if the central business district is the sun, then around it, we're going to have suburban residential. So that's like fountain. We might have a light industrial park. Um, that would be like the Denver Tech Center um, up in, oh, no, not necessarily that. Um, it would be like the power plant. Ha, huh? how about the power plant here in Colorado Springs? Office parks. I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, service nodes, where there is a hospital, a park, a university, uh, retail centers and malls. Uh, obviously, like when malls were a huge thing, there was, you could find a lot of malls all over the place. And then transportation hubs and airports are obviously usually on the outside, the periphery of those galactic models. Okay, you'll want to pause, do a little quiz. Okay, various models and theories that explain how cities evolve. No model is perfect. They try to make sense of housing, transportation, and business land patterns, and times change based on technology, transportation, industry. Okay. Cities outside the United States have patterns of development and structure that show the influence of colonizers or economics. So if we're talking about like not a North American city, um, they have a different model. So we're going to look at Latin America, Southeast Asia, and Africa. And guys, we're almost done. So hang in there. Okay. Early Latin American cities were regulated by laws called the land, the law of the Indies. It was mandated by Spain and they controlled social, political, and economic structure. So when the colonists showed up to, to areas in Latin America, they basically said, okay, this is how we're going to divide out what's here. As a result, Latin America colonial cities resemble Spanish cities in many ways. Um, remember the concentric zone model and the sector model? This is like a moosh of the two. And you guys can see that ev that's evident on here. Okay. All right, um, the market and CBD is right in the middle, and then it will have a spine, this long green line, leading to a mall, okay? There will be high-class residential along this mall, and when we say mall in this model, we're not talking about like a shopping mall. It's going to be more like a central, like cultural plaza. Industrial area on the outskirts, nobody wants to hear or smell or see that if they don't have to. Okay, zone of maturity around the CBD market. This is going to be a place that maybe used to be where people lived, but then as the city has grown, it might have become like kind of like rundown ghetto area of an area of a city. Area of gentrification. That's going to be a place again where they're like, ooh, we should gut all these old nasty houses and apartments. Let's remodel them and then sell them for triple the price. Um, and it completely changes the demographic of who lives there. Okay. Zone of in situ accretion, a mix of middle and low class housing. Um, so again, low class typically still need to have easier access to that central business district because they rely on public transportation or walking. Um, they're not necessarily owning vehicles to commute. The disamenity zone, extremely low income. Um, that's going to be, again, like your highest imp impoverished areas. Okay. Perificio. Oh, perifer Eco, oh my God, periferico, well, squatter settlements. That's the outside, it's the periphery. Um, and that, again, we saw that in Latin America. All right. Southeast Asia, like the Latin American model, resembles a combination of concentric and sector zone. The port is the center. There's not necessarily a central business district, but most of the components of a CBD are found around the port. Then there's always going to be a Western commercial zone, which is European and Western merchants. Remember, a lot of the products are made in Southeast Asia, but they ship them out to Europe and the Western hemisphere for, for, for being bought. Alien commercial zones, so like Chinese merchants, I know that sounds like a crazy name, um, but China, they kind of have their own like market agreements with many of these cities that, that is not, their agreements are different than like a European or a Western agreement. Government zones, obviously you got to have like your, you know, capital or like your government offices close to the port, high class residential zones where the ultra rich live, newer suburbs mixed with squatter settlements. So they may be gentrified pockets of the squatter settlements. And then you see like pockets of really nice neighborhoods and then agriculture and industry are going to be on those outskirts. Okay. So again, imagine this like a wedge. So a Southeast Asian um, model is often the city is built on the water and then it radiates out from there. Okay. Africa. This is based on sub-Saharan African cities as these were influenced by European colonizers. This goes back to unit four. Remember the, you know, African 
scramble, the uh, Ber Berlin uh, conference, where they went in and divided up all of Africa to the Europeans. So again, it shouldn't surprise us that a lot of the cities in sub-Saharan Africa still today look like they could be in Europe because they were developed by European colonizers. Okay. You'll see three traditional CBDs. You'll have a traditional. That's the sidewalk with vendors. There's only like one story buildings. That's like how it used to be. Then enter the Europeans and you're going to see European colonizer built. All of a sudden you're starting to see grid pattern streets and multi-story buildings. And then finally you'll have your open air markets. And those are obviously what those are. Those are those go back to like the traditional idea, um, but they're going to be found on the outskirts of all this. Okay. Infrastructure and services are close together. The farther away you get from the center, the less infrastructure you have. So again, um, schools, hospitals, rail, sewage are going to be better and more available in this near the center versus the further you get out. Um, neighborhoods are divided. So again, um, a lot of these were divided along ethnic lines, racial lines, religious lines, um, whether you were a native African versus a European, um, they were very clear about making those divisions. Um, shanty turns, shanty, shanty towns and squatter settlements are located on the outskirts of the city. So here's a little question for you to pause on. Let me move myself off your stimulus here. You can pause and go through this. Okay. What's our takeaway? Ah. Again, various theories and models that explain how cities form. These models and theories try to make sense of housing, transportation, and business land use patterns. Cities outside America have different patterns of development that show colonizer or economic development. And it's helpful to look at these models to understand initial development, but obviously we've changed. And so keep in mind, some of these models could have been outdated because economic and residential changes that have happened. Okay, we're going to end it there for today. You guys have been awesome. I will see you guys soon for part two of your unit six notes. Have a great rest of the day.